Hi, welcome to KubeCon 2021 in Los Angeles. This session is about running workloads at edge in a new way using WebAssembly with Kubernetes. You're about to get updates from a... Uh, I'm Steve Wong with VMware, representing the Kubernetes IoT Edge Working Group. I'm joined by Dan Bozanek of Red Hat and Kilton Hopkins of Edgeworks, but they couldn't be here physically. Uh, but they graciously prepared recordings will, which we'll be patching in, and they are going to be online for the Q&A section. The agenda, we're going to do a brief intro to what WebAssembly is, why and where it might be useful. Then Dan and Kilton uh, jumped hands-on and tried out WebAssembly with Kubernetes, and they're going to give a report on what the current experience and future potential is like. We'll wrap up with links on how you can join the working group of people trying to apply Kubernetes at Edge. What is WebAssembly? Well, it's an open standard for portable programs that can be written in almost any language. They are extremely portable. A WebAssembly can be run unchanged on ARM, x86, and other CPUs, and they're also not locked into an OS. Uh, WebAssembly was originally designed to run inside of a web browser in a safe way, but people discovered that it was also useful as a portable and efficient way to run sandbox code in other places far beyond a browser context. These were the runtimes that uh, support WebAssembly range down to support tiny OS-less microcontrollers, you know, the kinds of things that might cost $8 and run for two years on a, on a coin cell battery. Um, all these aspects make them attractive for running on devices with constrained resources. Uh, so how does WebAssembly compare to Docker? Well, Solomon Hikes, uh, who's often credited as being the inventor of Docker, has been quoted as saying that if WebAssembly existed in 2008, Docker wouldn't have been needed. Uh, now, Docker is much more mature, and perhaps at this point, uh, you know, locked into some decisions and use cases, but uh, people have found issues with attempting to run Docker containers at edge on low resource devices. WebAssembly has a few attributes that position it behind Docker. It's less mature, it doesn't have the supporting landscape, but it's also got these attributes uh, that you can read on the slide that potentially position it ahead of Docker for these edge use cases. I'll tell you that I got in here at KubeCon on Saturday for the Regex conference, and by my read, the hallway track here has pretty much a third of the cool kids talking about WebAssembly. This, this just has a feel about it that something big could happen here. Um, it feels to me a lot like what Docker was like circa 20, 2013. Um, now, one of Docker's advantages is the maturity and the supporting landscape, but what if the existing tools, things like Kubernetes, could be adapted to uh, do similar, the same kinds of things they do with Docker containers, but for web assemblies? Um, could that be made to work? Well, you're about to see some demos where a couple people went out there and checked it out, and the quick answer is yes, but is it perfect? No. Um, you know, so it's hard to predict what will happen exactly. Um, this could be optimized, and Docker turns out to be the perfect orchestrator for web assemblies, or we could have a replay of the orchestrator wars that came about in the early days of containers. I'm not gonna pretend that I've got the answers to that. Uh, another observation is that, you know, almost 20 years ago, we had technology like MapReduce and Hadoop bringing, bringing compute to the data. Uh, in that case, it was to avoid expensive transport of, of the data, and Edge has something similar going on. It ne they'd like to ab avoid the big network transport co cost, but a lot of this is about latency and resilience. 
And WebAssembly looks like a good way to bring compute close to sources that are dealing with data sensors and data generation and event generation. Um, so, I don't know, why am I wearing this crazy suit? I'm wondering that myself, it's pretty uncomfortable. It's a plastic Halloween costume. But I think the potential here is really big. You know, the, the original uh, Kubernetes was designed for giant data centers where you would pool resource and uh, use that pooling to gain efficiency and operation at a large scale. Uh, in a way, Edge is similar but different. You know, it isn't really pooling resources, it's the opposite of it, but you're managing containers as a, at, at a large scale. If somebody can bring about this whole big picture of putting code in WebAssembly and managing to manage and govern it at scale, this has the potential to not just be like the existing cloud. This is as disruptive as a new type of cloud. And uh, I think that, that there's a chance that could happen. So in the demos you're about to see, I'm just gonna advance this. If you can read fast, fine, but I put it in the deck so you can look at it later, but we're gonna cover a lot of things. So right now, um, I'll bring on uh, Dayan of Red Hat. Okay, it's demo time. Uh, and today we actually have uh, two demos. The first demo will show how we can use uh, container technologies at, at the edge today and what are the some, some of the specifics of, of that use case. We'll talk about different uh, uh, CPU architectures and uh, how we can uh, allow our workloads to, to uh, access uh, the peripherals because our edge use case is most likely uh, would like to to access uh, some sensors or, or or some peripherals. That's the main use case. So let's start with the with the with the actual example that we're going to use. This is a simple Python script that uh, uh, uses the the DHT sensor attached to the GPIO uh, GPIO uh, uh, interface. And that script basically reads the, the, the temp temperature and humidity values from the script and formats a, a JSON payload and send that that payload to our uh, cloud, the, the draw cloud in this uh, particular instance, as we will see we will see soon. So, what do we need to do now in order to to, to build this and, and run this on a Raspberry Pi? As you can see here, uh, I am currently running an, an OS X system, uh, which is uh, an X88 platform in, in this uh, in this instance, and I want to build uh, an image that, that will run on our on, on a Raspberry Pi. There are multiple ways that, that we can we can do that, uh, like uh, getting a, a proper uh, proper withdrawal. Uh, uh, machine that will, that will do the build, but, but fortunately, for example, Doc, Docker BuildX tool uh, can help us here. And as you can see in this example, uh, we can provide a platform as a as a parameter to to, to the build and build uh, the image of of a appropriate uh, appropriate architecture that that uh, uh, can can be run uh, on 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 an ARM platform, right? So. So now that we have this, we actually want to run this script and allow it to access uh, a GPIO, right? Uh, and for that, uh, we can do uh, we need to do do things. We need to run our container uh, in a privileged mode, and we want to enable specifically uh, a device that will be uh, that that will be uh, uh, accessible from our container, and in this case, this this is the the dev uh, GPIO zero uh, zero. So as you can see now, uh, in a Raspberry Pi console, we we have a, a container that's running uh, this this container, and if you take a look at the the logs, 
you can see that, that we are successfully reading the sensor from the container and sending the data to the cloud. We won't spend too much time on the cloud today because it's, it's not the main topic, but we can say that uh, there's, a, there's a Kubernetes uh, IoT cloud platform called Drogue IoT that can accept all, uh, different kind of payloads. And, and uh, this, uh, in this example, we, we use uh, we use this payload, so you can see that that uh, our our data uh, are being sent uh, from the uh, fr from our device. Moreover, uh, there's a, there's an example of of the Quarkus application that we can use to build our backend applications that that will connect to the cloud. In this case, the Quarkus application uses the MQTT integration provided by, provided by the by the Draw Cloud. So you can find more information about all this uh, in, in the links uh, 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 that will be provided uh, in, in the slides. So finally, so now we can see that we have our container that, that is running. Uh, it's accessing the, the peripherals, it's uh, accessing the cloud. So how are we going to schedule that? There are multiple ways and, and uh, we we covered some of them in, in the slides uh, of this session. The simplest way uh, could be to provide a si simple system control uh, system control settings that, that will allow us to to run this uh, to run this uh, every time we uh, that a device reboots, right? So so we, we provide a simple system control. Uh, entry that will run our container every time uh, uh, the Docker service starts, uh, uh, every time the, the Raspberry Pi reboots. This is like a super minimal, minimal uh, uh, possible scheduling, so to say, of, of the system, but something like IOFOG using uh, a lightweight uh, Kubernetes like, like K3S or, or uh, some other uh, system like Ansible is usually a better solution, and that's that's a topic for for some other day. That concludes our containers at the edge demo for today. Uh, and for the change of pace, we will uh, create a second demo now, in which we will uh, compare uh, state of web uh, WebAssembly today how they compare to containers, how we can run them uh, in the Kubernetes environment, and uh, if and how we can we can uh, use them uh, at the edge, edge today. So in order to run uh, WebAssembly payloads in, uh, in Kubernetes, uh, we will use uh, the Crosslet project, uh, which is uh, a, a currently a CNCF uh, sandbox project and uh, Crosslet basically allows us to 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 add a node to to the Kubernetes uh, cluster which will be able to run WebAssembly payloads in a in a VASI environment as we ex explained earlier in, in earlier in the slides right so in order to start the demo I will use uh, my uh, uh, Kubernetes uh, on the desktop, on the on the OS X desktop, and as you can see here, I, I have one additional node here, which is currently uh, not uh, uh, not active, right? So in order to to start this node, I need to uh, start Crosslet uh, by executing Crosslet Vasi command and providing some basic uh, bootstrap. Uh, a bootstrap uh, configuration. Uh, once the Crosslet VASI is running, we will see that our node is now is ready. And as you can see, this is a, a special container run runtime, uh, which means that that uh, this this node will be able to run to run a uh, uh, VASM uh, VASM uh, payloads. So with this, uh, we have our basic infrastructure. We have a Kubernetes running with a, with, with a both control plane and and the, and the worker node that can run uh, VASM payloads. 
And now let's take a look at the, the concrete payload that, that we want to run. So I prepared a, a small cloud events VASI example. Uh, this is uh, this is the, the project that, that will emit cloud events uh, 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 to to the cloud and and receive and parse responses as as a as a cloud events as well. One of the reasons uh, why we we are uh, not being able to replicate the original project is, is that, as we said, the VASI at the moment is is not is not uh, 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 able to to access uh, sockets or or, or per peripherals like like a, like a G GPIO. But I, I expect this to change in the future, and, and we will definitely follow up uh, with a similar example that uh, that will do this. For now, we will use uh, VASI experimental HTTP library uh, and uh, connect it to, to the to the cloud events SDK, also written in, in Rust, and and uh, provide a way to to basically serialize the serialize cloud events from the from the HTTP requests uh, and uh, and uh, responses. As you can see here. Uh, we have a, uh, our event builder that, that will create create a, a, a proper event that we want to send, and uh, we can easily convert that into the HTTP request that, that can be used by the VASI experimental library. We'll then uh, post that to the uh, to the cloud and uh, appropriately. Uh, try to serialize uh, and, and uh, uh, parse the cloud event from the from the uh, from the from the response, right? So, what we need to do now uh, to actually uh, build this uh, payload uh, as a and, and run it run it uh, as a as a Kubernetes pod. That's that, that's that's the real question, right? So. In order to do that, uh, we we have to uh, compile it uh, with a with a with a special Rust target. Hope uh, uh, luckily uh, Rust comes with, with a good support for for the multiple architectures. And uh, what we need to do here is actually only install VASM32 VASI uh, uh, target. And use that, that target to, to, to build our to build our binary, right? So let's try this. I mean, uh, I have uh, the target already installed uh, at my machine, as you can see here. So that's all good. Now we can go and, and try to build uh, uh, build our our, program, our our workload. Uh, this will take a little bit. But as a result, we, we will uh, our our cargo builder will actually uh, provide a a, a VASM binary that uh, that can be run in a in a in a in a VASI environment. And one of, uh, example of that environment is called VASM VASM time, and that's actually used by by the Crosslet as well uh, to to execute these binaries. If you take a look at the payload now. Uh, one interesting thing to see here is, is the size of, of, of this payload, and it's only three megabytes, uh, uh, which will be important uh, for our late, later later discussion. But at the moment, uh, we our, our job is not done yet, because what we need to do is actually to uh, we need to convert this. Uh, uh, VASM binary in, into a container, into an OCI container that, that actually can be pulled uh, pulled by the by the crosslet. Luckily for that, there's a VASM to OCI uh, tool that can help us to to, to provide uh, to, to convert this uh, to appropriate image, as you can see here, and uh, and push that to to the container registry. Uh, it's important to say here that not all container registry registries today. Uh, support uh, all this, but uh, the the GitHub one that I, I was using uh, is supporting it. And ad another important thing is you can see here that the size of this container is basically the size of, of the of the VASM binary, so it's it's a uh, it's three megabytes, right? 
And if if you compare that to to any kind of container, even even the the simple one we we run previously, it's a uh, it's it's a it's a uh, quite a big difference. There are tools that can help us to to minimize the size of the, of the containers, uh, but but even with all that, uh, I I expect the the size difference to be to be at least uh, uh, an, an order of mag mag magnitude. Uh, uh, different, and that could be one of the big advantages of of, of using uh, using Vasm in in agile environments because it it really takes uh, a, a very little very little uh, uh, size of, of, of the container and it's easy easier to schedule over the over the over the networks. So now we we have to schedule this this container as a pod, and I have an example. Of that here, so you can see we will pull our, our image. But the important part here is is this the tolerations uh, section, and uh, uh, that basically tells us that this payload uh, is is a VASM to VASI architecture, and that we need to schedule that uh, or, or on a proper node that, that supports that uh, 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 that architecture. And and what basically. Uh, this means is that when we apply the, this uh, uh, this pod and and uh, add it to our Kubernetes to execute it, it will actually schedule schedule the pod uh, on our on our uh, crosslet uh, uh, crosslet node, as as uh, you can see, as you can see here. That's that's, that's the the exact node that we that we started uh, started earlier. Now we can see that uh, if the pod is actually running properly, and as we can see here, uh, it is right. So we, we we create our every couple of seconds we create our uh, cloud event, and then we uh, serialize it to a proper uh, a proper uh, HTTP request by the cloud event specification. Pause that. Uh, 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 to the appropriate uh, service and then parse the, parse the response back, right? And uh, that that works properly. And that concludes our VASM demo. Just to repeat, uh, we, we saw how to use... Uh, In the interest of time, so we have time for Q&A and jump to Kilton's, but he was showing a slide with resources and I'll close the presentation with that. So next up, Kilton Hopkins, uh, CTO of Edgeworks, and he's also lead of the IOFLOG project under the Eclipse Foundation. And it's uh, an industrial computer that is uh, sitting inside your smart factory. In that yeah, I think this started playing mid streams. Let me see if I could. And it's uh, an industrial computer that is uh, sitting inside your smart factory. In that situation, on top of the host Debian OS, choose a WebAssembly runtime and you're good. That's not the only thing you need. Something has to coordinate. Play the role similar to what Kubelet plays. So what is the agent that's going to start up, shut down, and monitor the status of the WebAssembly modules? That agent is going to do your workload management and your workload administration at the edge. So uh, a lot of opportunities for that. And I'm going to get into uh, in a couple more slides talking about some specific um, open source projects that are going in that direction or going to add that capability. But you also need to have edge connectivity handling. So here's a situation where a pure Kubernetes environment might not be suitable. And this has to do with the edge, not doesn't have to do particularly with the web assembly, but just something to note. In uh, a pure Kubernetes environment, you have uh, what I would call the standard issue kubelet, and uh, the communication um, back to uh, the remainder of the system, the master and so on, is going to be rather fast and frequent. Uh, in an edge environment, that's probably not suitable. What you would rather have is uh, a lighter amount of traffic with a little bit more tolerance for breaks in connectivity or limited bandwidth, et cetera. In some cases, pure disconnection. Yeah, I'm offline for two days, but I'm still listed as uh, an active node and nothing, no pod is getting evicted from that node because it's understood that it will be checking in uh, maybe every couple of days. It's a really good example of edge connectivity environment problem.
So choose an edge native technology if you have an edge environment that is not suitable in terms of bandwidth and, and always on connection for being able to deploy uh, directly uh, your Kubernetes environment out to that edge location. Of course, if you run all of Kubernetes on the edge, um, then including something like microcates or uh, K3S, then it's different because now you're talking about land traffic, but that still may not be suitable for devices that are on low power wireless, et cetera, et cetera, just something to think about. And so then the last requirement is you're going to need a repository of the binary code, the WASM files, similar to Docker Hub for Docker containers, right? So where are you storing? How are you serving? How are you verifying the integrity of uh, when you're going to get out into production and at scale, these are all pieces needed. So since we have the requirements, now let's actually talk about the types of edge deployments where, where you might want to use WebAssembly. For the purposes of this presentation, there are two types of edge deployment that you need to worry about. In the first type, it's no edge device interfacing required. It's all about latency benefits, bandwidth constraint benefits, security, privacy. In other words, I'm going to take a workload and I want to take it, uh, package it as a WebAssembly module, and I want to push it to an edge node that is close to where people will consume it. So on the LAN as a, um, a web interface for people to do real-time voting interaction uh, for some um, entertainment purpose. Great, it's just a box on the edge. If it's on the network, it's fine. It doesn't have any specific interfacing with an edge device, just, just a network layer, but that's not that many edge use cases. That's just some. The vast majority of edge use cases are the second type here, which I've listed as processing data from edge devices. Here, you're actually taking in some kind of sensor data. You're talking to a, a camera. You're doing some actuation. Maybe you're using the, the GPIO pins of a board in order to drive LED indicators or take in data from a microphone. There's all kinds of possibilities. Here is where you actually need an interface layer. So WASI is going to be required or WASI or similar, some similar concept. And now the host environment becomes application specific. What I mean by that is you can't just pick any old edge node. You have to pick the edge node that has the camera that you want. And so um, that's something to keep in mind about edge deployments with WebAssembly or otherwise is that um, you have to have the right stuff in place in the right places on the globe in order to get the data that you want. And then you have to find a way to interface. This is reminiscent of like with Android, with uh, the, the hardware abstraction uh, interface uh, there. So the HIDL, the hardware abstraction layer interface definition language. How am I defining the way for um, calls like open camera and get frame and so on to interface with the actual hardware. And so this is work to be done because this is not ready. This is not out there universal ready for you to use. If your edge deployment is this type of edge deployment, think about how you're going to access the special edge resources that you want to actually process the data from with your WebAssembly, and then how are you going to accomplish that? So what's the current state and the future? So what does WASI look like today? Uh, super exciting, that's for sure. There's a, there's a link at the end of this presentation to look at a blog post about basically defining WASI. Here's WASI, come help. It's a great blog post to look at you up to speed, just one read. But Currently, it's about handling the core system calls, things like files and networks. So like read, write a file, uh, get access to the network and so on. And these things are gonna take some time and the principles of portability and security are fantastic for building out WASI, but it means that we're gonna do it right. And doing it right means you're not gonna have a proliferation of a whole bunch of WASI features, which means access to like cameras and stuff. You're not going to have that immediately because it's going to be done right. And so um, do you need access to that stuff today? If you do, how can you find a way to interface? Maybe it's best to wrap it as a container and then your WebAssembly running in container can have you know, that stuff available. There's ways to think about it. And um, so let's talk for a moment about edge specific challenges. So WebAssembly modules are the new microservices. What does that mean? Well, microservice doesn't mean container but it arrived, those two technologies, so the architecture of microservices arrived around the time of container technology. Well, uh, any modular code uh, that can be mixed and matched and paired together with microservices. And in that architecture, 
to multi-microservice world, meaning your application is likely to be built of multiple microservices. So if you're multiple WebAssembly modules now in your new architecture, how do you do the interchange of data between them? That is a common problem in edge computing because things are not always interconnected, especially between edge nodes that might be in different buildings, different cities, different vehicles, something to think about. And how do you go from edge to cloud and so on? with the data, not in terms of the administrative connectivity, right? What's my workload, but in terms of where do I send these bytes that I gathered from this camera? And then now uh, another edge challenge is dynamic access. I start a WebAssembly module on an edge node that needs access to the microphone that's installed in the board. Well, I didn't know I needed access to that until I discovered I have a microphone and that's when I deployed the workload and then the agent on that Edge node told me, hey, these are the things we've got. Oh, great, microphone, we want that. We want to process that data in real time. Now, if, unless you've planned the entire host OS to have all this stuff exposed through a WASI or WASI-like layer, chances are pretty good things will pop up and you'll need to allocate permissions, allocate permissions upon discovery. This is a big challenge of edge computing in general. And you couple that with the challenge of the not yet build out interface layer for WebAssembly and you've got a lot to think about. And that means an opportunity to contribute to all of the build out of this in the world. So jump in and help. So last is certainly not least, what is it gonna be like to integrate WebAssembly with existing edge technologies? The easiest path is to go where edge technologies already exist. Why would you deploy new WebAssembly edge technologies when building the edge computing world is hard enough? Let's, let's put it on top of or integrate it with. So um, it's really a choice of WebAssembly runtime. And that'll drive what features you have available because not all the runtimes are the same and they don't all have a standard set of, of features yet that eventually it will all be table stakes. Every WebAssembly runtime will kind of have the basics, but now you kind of pick a runtime based on what it's giving you and what's been built out. Seems like we're going to be operating containers and WebAssembly modules side by side for quite some time, maybe even one wrapped in another. Something to get used to. It's probably going to allow us to fix a lot of things before we move completely to a WebAssembly world. And the use cases of WebAssembly at the edge are going to drive the specific advancements. So in other words, I want to access a camera on a battery powered smart camera device. I would like to use WebAssembly. I will do the work to build out what's needed for the value of my use case. Will I also build out access to the temperature sensor in the camera? No, I didn't need it, I'm skipping it, right? So the use case determines where advancements are made and everything else will probably just have to wait until it can get caught up. That's about it. Uh, so hopefully that was uh, uh, helpful and uh, let's pass it back to Steve Wong to uh, wrap up this, uh, this session. Thanks, Hilton. So here are the resources that they use. There's a GitHub repository with the code that Dion was showing. Uh, when they took this thing around the block for the test drive, they found uh, these various open source projects, highly recommended. Uh, the blog post that Kilton talked about is the one stop to, if you're gonna read one thing, pick up on everything, get up to speed, that's it. Um, a, a few other things to read that are recommended. So this session was put on by the Kubernetes IoT Edge Working Group. If you're interested in applying Kubernetes in ways that uh, uh, get jobs done at Edge, that's a good place to come and discuss it. Um, some people are looking for a solution that would run whole Kubernetes clusters at Edge, but some of the others are just using things like WebAssembly that will feed data and event streams into a Kubernetes uh, cluster up at a higher level. Um, you can download the deck and get the links to join um, the group itself, join the meetings that are held by Zoom, um, converse on the Slack channel. This Slack channel we're going to be using for the Q&A at the end of this session. So if you're watching this on the recording or we get shut down because we hit the time limit, go on that Slack channel for this group and uh, Kilton and Dion are on there right now and they'll hang around a little while after this closes. So you can ask questions there. Uh, we do have a YouTube channel with the recordings of the meetings. Um, these are speaker contacts. We're on GitHub. I think we all share those same GitHub IDs on Twitter and actually the Slack channel is probably the best way to get a hold of us uh, after this event. Um, 
So that's it. You can download the deck right here. That's the SCED site for uh, the conference, and I have uploaded the deck. I maybe made one or two edits, so later this afternoon I might push an updated version there if you download it a couple hours from now, but this one is pretty close to what I just presented. Uh, so that's it. If anybody's got any questions, and Dion and Kilton, if the questions are about their demos, they are online now, I believe. Uh, so I, um, I got a few confusion about um, the whole um, context of uh, running WebAssembly in a uh, Edge and the Kubernetes situation. Uh, so it sounds like the Kubernetes itself becomes a bottleneck needs to be resolved by things like K3S first, then you can run some more efficient container in WebAssembly, that's... No, I, I, I don't think that's, uh, that's what the situation is. What it is is Kubernetes, of course, was designed to orchestrate Docker containers. And a lot of the assumptions that w went into the standard kubelet that gets loaded on a worker node in every Kubernetes cluster presumes that it's managing Docker containers running on a Docker runtime. What changes with WebAssembly is you have a different runtime, some kind of runtime that would run the WebAssembly, and some of the presumptions that Kubelet made are a little different. So there is an open source project called Crustlet that sort of convinces the, this is an oversimplification, but let's just say it convinces the Kubernetes control plane that it's talking to a Kubelet, and it's close enough that you can utilize it to, uh, you know, d disclose what workloads you want running, uh, you know, under what kind of context, and have these things scheduled to run on nodes running the crustlet instead of a kubelet. And then the crustlet uh, knows how to deal with the WebAssembly runtime and gets that workload running. So um, it should work with any standard Kubernetes. I don't think you necessarily would need any particular one groomed for Edge, but the Kubernetes distros that are made for Edge should certainly work for just fine. Uh, is there like production use case of this thing you just mentioned, the cross-link something? Well, I don't know. I think personal opinion is that this stuff is so new that production use cases and a lot of those edge use cases are pretty mission critical. I wouldn't do it, but a lot depends on your tolerance for being a pioneer and exploring things that might still be a little buggy and improvement. Okay, we've reached our time limit. I'll hang around out in the hallway a little bit. And like I say, if your questions are about those demos, Kilton and uh, Dayan are online and I would just log in and go onto that Slack channel and talk to them through there. Thank you.